Well, my father was a builder, a master builder. And in England in 1911, business wasn't very good. And he had built a lot of houses which he couldn't let. Now that must sound very odd today, but it was so in those days. And when a friend of his who'd gone to Canada sometime early on, came home to see him, he said, you know, why are you putting up with this recession here? Why don't you join me in Canada? Together we could make a real do of things. And then within the space of one evening, my father decided to cut all his losses and go to Canada to join uh, his friend. Well, um, in those days, I, one went to New York by fast electing liners, one of which went every day of the week, I understand, and then on to Canada by train. Because at that time of the year, when the St. Lawrence is frozen, uh, one would have to go to St. John's or Halifax, which were small ports, and then a very tiresome journey across Canada from there. So we were going to New York. And uh, my father made this decision this evening. I knew nothing about it, of course, I was in bed. But my mother was absolutely horror-stricken. Well, to really make the point there, I must tell you that my mother was a quite a remarkable woman. She had married when she was quite young, and she had made a, she was 18, and she'd married a very bad marriage, and her parents weren't at all pleased with her. But they were right, and she was wrong. And by the time she was 31, she had had nine children, nine babies, and they had all died. She had known what it was to be desperately unhappy and poor. And her children died and um, left her absolutely bereft. Uh, and with all this trouble behind her, which I'm quite sure made for the wonderful character she had. She had no illusions about things. Her feet were firmly on the ground. And so she met my father, married him, and they were divinely happy. He was so good to her. And I was born, which added to her joy. She had a lovely home. My father had a motor car, which in those days was rather remarkable. And everything was wonderful until this night. And the moment this arrangement had been made to go to Canada, my mother had this dreadful premonition. She'd never had one before, and she never had one after. But she said, no, we, we, we can't do this. It's quite wrong. Something dreadful will happen. And I, I tell you what the sort of woman she was. She'd got both feet on the ground, and for her to behave like that was absolutely unbelievable to everyone. But she just had that premonition. And my father said, oh, nonsense. And, of course, the time went by, and the house was sold, and we were ready to go, and we went down to the ship. And she said to him, now, I don't want any more unhappiness about this, but my mind is made up, and I will not go to bed in this ship. I shall sleep in the daytime, and I shall sit up at night. And I so well remember what he said to her. He said, if you want to be so stupid, I can't stop you. She said, I know, but I'm going to do it. And she did. And she sat up. Wednesday night, Thursday night, Friday night, and on Saturday night, she heard an odd sound, and she awakened my father and made him go up on the deck. And he came back and told her that it was ice flows that she could hear grinding against the side of the ship, and not to be so silly. And at breakfast the next morning, other people said they had gone up on deck. They had heard this sort of noise, and uh, they agreed it was ice flows. And my mother then said, well, surely if there's ice in abundance in the sea, there could be icebergs. And this officer who was at our table, he said, oh, nonsense, this is an iceberg. There's an enormous thing. We should see an iceberg. You've nothing to be afraid of. And uh, that was on the Sunday morning. And for the first time since we had gone on board the ship, she didn't get up from breakfast and go straight to bed, which was what she normally did, because it was Sunday and she thought she'd like to go to church, which she did. And then we had lunch together before she went to bed. And I remember that meal so well because that was the last meal that the three of us ever had together. Because in the evening, by dinner time, I was in bed, of course. And she just came and joined in whatever was happening during the evening, and that sort of thing. And my father got very cross because he had every reason to dislike gambling. His father had been a compulsive gambler and had died utterly penniless from being quite a wealthy man. 
And so everybody was gambling on this Sunday night. They were making books, having service, and having sweepstakes as to what time she would get in so many minutes past so and so. My father could have nothing to do with it. And so he went to bed quite early, for him anyway. And my mother sat down to sew and read. And she looked up at him, he was reading. He said he'd got a very interesting book. But quite quickly, he went to sleep and she got up and took the book from him and set her down again. And she said at 10 minutes to 12, she felt a slight bump. And she said it was just like a train pulling into a station. It just jerked. It was very slight, but she said she knew that it was this dreadful something and she wakened my father. She wakened me and my father said no, he wasn't going up on deck again after the night before. But she literally pulled him out of bed and made him go up. And she then said she was going to dress me and I being sleepy and very naughty said I wasn't going to be dressed, nothing to be dressed for, I'm going back to bed. My father came back very quickly because he could get up to the boat deck in the lift very quickly from where our cabin was. And um, he came back and he picked me up and wrapped this blanket tightly around me as if I were a baby. And my mother said nothing to him, and I used to say to her sometimes, years afterwards, I can't understand why you didn't say to him, what was it? Which she certainly did not say. And she said, I didn't have to say, what was it? I didn't know what it was, but I knew it was this dreadful something that I had to live with for months, and there was nothing more I could say. So he put his very thick coat on her, and put another one on himself, and without any words at all, we went out of the cabin and into the lift and up onto the boat deck. Now, if we hadn't done that at that time, I very much doubt I'd be talking to you today because, as you know, there were less than... Uh, there was accommodation for less than 800 people in the lifeboats and she was carrying 2,200. So it was a question as who was there in time to get into one of the all too few lifeboats. Well, they weren't launched very quickly because at first, no one thought anything was going to happen. But my father went away and spoke to an officer, and he said, um, they are going to launch lifeboats, but you'll all be back on board for breakfast. And so they launched these boats, and to my father helped. He knew a lot about the sea. And he put me in the lifeboat and told me to be good. He said to me, hold mummy's hand. And I thought he was coming after me, but he didn't. Then it dawned on me of course, that he wasn't coming, because I wouldn't see him anymore. And that collision was 10 minutes to 12, and the Titanic sank at 20 past 2. So if we had had enough lifeboats, no one would have died that night at all. And it would have been a nine days wonder that the ship sank on its maiden voyage. It didn't matter, nobody died, and that would have been that. And here we are all these years after, with the whole world still interested in the Titanic. And we rowed away uh, from the ship as fast as we could because one has to do that because I believe the suction when a vessel goes down is absolutely enormous. And we rowed away and I didn't close my eyes at all. I saw that ship sink. And I saw that ship break in half. And for so many years, people have argued with me about that. But now at last, it has been proven beyond all doubt that she did break in half. I know she did, I saw her. And the forepart went down nose first and the other. The stern of that ship stood up in the water for quite a long time, or it seemed a long time to me, and then keeled over. And we heard the dreadful sound of people drowning, which was, oh, unbelievable. And then, because our lifeboat was so full, so over full, the officers called all the boats together and transhipped some of us one in that boat and two in that and three in that, and I got separated from my mother. And uh, that was the most terrifying thing to happen to a child. And uh, we were picked up, as you know, in the morning by this little ship, the Carpathia. And the rescue uh, of people from lifeboats in mid-ocean is quite a terrifying thing. These little boats, shall we say, draw up alongside, for want of a better expression, to what looks like an enormous vessel. She was quite a small vessel, the, the Carpathia, but she looked big from there. And then how do you get on board? You don't have a gangplank like you do when you're ashore. And so they opened a, 
uh, a sort of, I don't know whether the word is right, a hatch in the side of the ship where the luggage used to be laid. And um, they threw down rope ladders and people like my mother and other grown-ups had to climb up in mid-ocean up a swaying rope ladder, rope ladder, which she said was the most terrifying thing. A sailor behind sort of holding on. And then how, what can the children do? We couldn't climb up a rope ladder. So they got these big luggage nets and the mesh is very wide apart. It's quite a big mesh. Children would have slipped through it, small children. Anyway, our legs and feet would have gone through it. So each child was put in a sack. And I remember being petrified when I was put in that sack and it was tied around and the sack full of these children were put into these huge nets and quite safely, of course, hauled aboard. But that really was quite terrifying. And then having got on board, of course, I couldn't find my mother. And I didn't find her for hours, but eventually I found her. And I'm quite sure one of the most pathetic things must have been the whole of the next day, how these poor women, such as my mother, my mother, roamed about the ship looking to see if they could see the husband they left behind. But no one found anyone. And, and uh, we just went to New York in this little ship. And then my mother's first words were when she landed, how soon can I go home? We came straight back here. And as I say, all these years later, this interest is profound. And it's because there was no need for anyone to die. No one should have died. Had she had enough lifeboats for two and a half hours and a very smooth sea, nobody would have died. And one life is worth more than the whole ship, surely. That is what I saw, that is what I remember. And there are hardly any of us now to share this memory, of course. I'm the only living survivor now that can remember it and um, get about, so to speak. There's a, a very good friend of mine, she's much older than me, but she's ill and she's had a stroke and she's deaf. And the other two in England, beside that lady, are too young to remember it. They were under five. And in America, as far as I know, and I think I've got this right, uh, there are no survivors who can remember it. There's an old lady over 100, but she doesn't remember it. So, you, you, bless her heart, you have to count her out. Apart from that, I don't think it's anyone that can really tell the whole story of it, except myself. We were booked in a ship called the Philadelphia. And this cold strike came and she didn't sail. And we were then offered a berth in the Titanic, which absolutely delighted my father. I thought it was wonderful. The whole world was talking about that ship. We had to pay extra money to travel in Well, when I boarded her at Southampton, well, you can't see very much of a ship you're boarding. You can just see the bit of the gangway you go up, so that wasn't very much. She seemed very, very large. Indeed, she was, but particularly to a child who hadn't been in the ship before. I saw a little dog that was travelling um, without its master in care of the crew, a dear little dog, which I was allowed... My father managed to get round one of the sailors to let us go aft um, where this little dog was. There were a lot of dogs on board, and I loved that little dog dearly. And it, it was drowned, poor little thing. And I was very um, touched the first time I opened the first page of Walter Lord's book, A Night to Remember, he mentions that little dog. And I always wanted one like that, but I didn't get one for many years, but I did eventually. And I remember a lot about playing on the deck with that little dog. Um, I remember the dining saloon very well, which was very nice. I remember the playroom, I suppose it was a playroom, where I played quite a lot with other children. And the decks where well, my father walked with me, of course, the second class decks. But uh, it all, it isn't blurred at all, but it's all shadowed by what happened eventually. There wasn't any panic until the lifeboats left, and then there was panic galore. We were down on the ocean. We could hear them running about on the decks and screaming. You can imagine people came up from their cabin, went onto the deck, no lifeboat, tearing around the other side. That's when the panic was there. There wasn't any panic at the time I got in the lifeboat because there weren't enough people up there. And were there enough people there to just get into the lifeboats? 
But after that, when the others started coming up from their cabins and there were no boats, gosh, there was panic. We could hear it. Definitely. But the most dreadful sound of all is the sound of people drowning. The screams. Absolutely ghastly. My mother used to say sometimes, she couldn't get me to talk about it for years, but if ever I did, anyone did talk to me and I said that, she used to say yes. But do you remember the silence that followed it? And that's quite right. It's the whole world stood still that night. Once the lights had gone, the ship had gone, the sound had gone. Oh, it was dreadful. Oh, that I, could, I can't possibly describe. I can only tell you that I'm a terrible coward. And I never look, look at pictures of it going down, ever. When I get various books and things, I quick turn that page over very quickly. In fact, if you look through some of my Titanic books, you'll probably find a piece of paper slotted in that page, but I can't bear to look at it. It was an absolute, I suppose it was a microcosm, is that the word? Looking at it from low down on the sea, it was dreadful. I don't like looking at pictures of, of ships at all. I don't like pictures of the Titanic particularly because I can see it happening, you know. Well, there's no question about the fact that they played and there's no question about the fact that, that after we were down on the water and they were playing, they played one um, version of the hymn, Near My God to Thee, of which there are three. I've had this out so many times. And the one they played was the one that was played in church some months after when I was with my grandmother and I was so frightened I came out of church, I ran out, I knew the tune so well. But they won't have it, the Americans won't have it. And people say, no, no, it's not, it, it was just ragtime, but it wasn't, it wasn't. But we were down on the ocean by then. They were playing when we left the deck, of course they were. They'd been playing all the evening, I suppose. There are still um, threats of legal things even these days about whether the ship that was so close to us was the Californian or not. I mean, I saw that ship. It's terribly close. Now, that, the sort of thing that I must emphasize is people say, say this, say that, say the other. And they're now asking me, was that the Californian you saw? I cannot possibly tell you. I've always been told with Board of Trade inquiries and everything that went that that was the Californian. But I, Eva Hart, can't make that statement, but I don't know. I mean, short of going up to the ship and looking at the name on it, I could, you wouldn't know. I can't think that the two big inquiries, one in America and one here, which were held at the time, would have, would have been wrong about that. But they're trying to say now, of course, that it was so, as you know. But I refuse to say that it was, because I don't know. And the other thing I'm saying is that I didn't see a ship 19 miles away. I saw a ship that was so close, and they said at the time it was less than nine miles away. Now they're trying to say it was 19. Um, I saw it, you know, it wasn't just lights on the horizon, you could see it was a ship. And I saw our rockets being fired, which that ship must have seen. Well, this inquiry says that they did see it, but they didn't think it was a port hint of danger, but I would have thought in the middle of the Atlantic, in the middle of the night, <laughs> that rockets must mean trouble. Not only my opinion. But undoubtedly in the next few months this will come up again. I've been interviewed and talked to about it and I still say I don't know. I can only tell you it was a ship. My father's sister lived in New York. And the plan was that we were going to stay with her for, I think it was three or four days, and then get the train through to Canada. So, of course, she met us, and we were whisked straight off to her home. And I was ill. I had, when, that, when they threw me from one boat into the other, they bruised me very badly right across, and uh, I had lots of bouts of sickness, so they took me straight away into a hospital to have a look at me. And so I didn't see really much of the furore naturally and we came back home quite quickly now coming home my mother went to bed every night and slept 
I was the one that was a terror coming home. I wouldn't come out of the cabin. She lured me up onto the deck one day, and that was about all. <laughs> I was terrified. Well, she came back to her parents, who of course were getting on. She was 50, by then, my mother. And um, we lived in this small town with my parents. And then I went, I had a great musical talent, I was told. Anyway, I, I played the piano very well and I taught. And at 18, I had my voice trained and I did a lot of professional singing. And she died when I was 23 and I went off to Australia. Well, I went to Singapore to, to stay with her godson who invited me to do that. And then I went on to Australia with the idea that I might live there, I wasn't sure, but I, I did a lot of singing, in, and even in those days, I was singing on the radio in Australia, and that's a long time ago, 1929. And um, but I didn't like it well enough to want to live there, so I came back to England. And uh, I came back to England, and I, f I had three or four really bad colds, you know, really bad colds, and I couldn't sing. And I lost a lot of engagements through not, uh, not being able to go, and I thought, well, perhaps I came back in the winter, you see, from this very warm climate. So I thought, well, perhaps I better do something else. So um, a friend of mine had a very large a wholesale motor business, and so I joined him there and ran the wholesale department. Still did a lot of singing in the evenings and that sort of thing. And then, of course, when the war broke out, um, like everyone else, it wasn't a question of what I wanted to do. I was a single woman on my own, and I could very easily have been sent up to a munition factory in goodness knows where. So um, I went to the Ministry of Food, and I was the food officer for this borough, and I hated it. <laughs> I dislike it. Filling in forms and answering questions, no good to me. So I got out of that and went to work in a factory um, where they were making not actually munitions, but parts for guns and for what we called bomb slips, the things that the bombs were slipped with, I suppose, out of the aeroplane. And uh, I liked that. It was people. I was working with people. And the um, director uh, let me join the Industrial Welfare Society and paid for my training. So I became an Industrial Welfare Officer, and that I did to the end of my working days, which I loved because it was dealing with people. In addition to that, I was a magistrate, um, and I loved that too because, again, it's people. Now I'm so old, I have to just sit and talk about it. <laughs>